Today we're going to be looking at a Buick Rodriguez, which is also very similar to the Pontiac Aztec. Cluster has some slight differences, but similar anyways. Anyways, today's problem is odometer error. Now with this family of cluster, there are two things that can cause it to say odometer error. Uh, one of those things is if it cannot communicate the, through the serial bus. Um, it will say air, but if that's your case, you also will lose most of your gauges. Your gas gauge and temp gauge will not work. I think the mile per hour and RPM will. I have to double check the wiring to see if those are analog or not, but I know for sure your gas and temp will not work if it's a communication error. Now that may or may not necessarily be the fault of the cluster. It could be kind of anything in the vehicle can cause a communication error, but this one has an error because of a corrupt EEPROM. Uh, it's actually an odometer problem, uh, not a communication problem. So I can show you kind of quick, if I can get that in display here. So if you watch this, this family of cluster will uh, um, show you the odometer value for a few seconds when you first power it up, and then it'll go to error when it can't see any serial communication. But if I power it up right now, uh, you will see zero, odometer zero, so that is not right. So that is how I know we're dealing with an EEPROM issue and not a communication issue. And also the customer did state all the gauges were working fine. So again, that just tells me that we need to look at the EEPROM, not the communication. Uh, so I tried the uh, X100 tool to see if I could get lucky and just program um, over the top of the corrupt data on the EEPROM, but no, I keep on getting a security verification failed error. Um, so I'm gonna have to open this up, uh, pull the EEPROM, well, remove the EEPROM, I'm not gonna use that one anymore. I have to burn or write a new EEPROM and we're gonna go through that right now. Here's the board out of the cluster. We're just gonna take a quick uh, look over here. So it has the X15s in it. These are gonna be replaced uh, with X27s. Those will be updated. Some of the backlighting is starting to go out. So I'm gonna be replacing all of the backlighting. Uh, now these bulbs here in the black area, these are just gonna be for like seat belt, cruise control, blinker, those kind of indicators. Uh, backlighting is only gonna be here with the white background. Um, and the bulbs for the display have completely gone out just because uh, just from handling the cluster was enough to take those out. Since these bulbs are on all the time, they do not last as long as the backlighting, which these are only on when the headlights are on. So it's going to be getting new stepper motors, new bulbs, new bulbs under the LCD. Uh, and then the EEPROM is this guy right here. Uh, typical for GM. It's an Atmel part, so I'm going to be pulling that off. I'm going to be using my Hakko FR300 for all of the through-hole desoldering, so that would be the stepper motors and LCD display. To remove the uh, original lamps, you can usually just rock them back and forth and break them off the solder joints. This is if it's still the original uh, lamps from the factory. Their flow soldering technique doesn't use a whole lot of solder. And if we look here, for those of you that saw my last video, this is the four megahertz crystal we talked about. So that would make this chip here, the transceiver, which is uh, 27833. That's a different part number from the other uh, boards that GM typically uses. And now to remove the LCD display to get to the bulbs under it, uh, they did conformal coat over these leads. So I'm going to use a little rubbing alcohol and a little bit of uh, scraping to remove as much as the conformal coating as I can, just because it tends to kind of clog up the uh, desoldering pump. I'll be using the same 
Paco FR300 for these pins as I did for the stepper motors, but uh, I'm just gonna get the bulk of that conformal coating off of there. And just because um, it's a bit of a fight getting these pins um, whoops, out, I'm going to put a little flux down. These pins, that usually it's harder because uh, of the double-sided board. Um, solder likes to flow through to the other side, which is always harder to suck solder up from the back side. The stepper motors, they're also through-hole tube, but... There's not, they don't use as much solder, so it doesn't typically flow through. So it's a little bit easier. Like here's one pad right here. You can see that flowed through. So it's usually easier to remove stepper motors than it is the LCD display. But I'm gonna go ahead and put a little Amtec flux down just to kind of help things out a little bit. I kind of need all the advantages I can get to pull the LCD panel, just so it's not a complete miserable experience because it can be if you don't have the right tools. I am kind of giving the tool a couple extra seconds before I hit the trigger to cause the vacuum uh, just to make sure the solder flows all the way from the top to the bottom to make sure I'm sucking the solder all the way through. Just makes it easier when you're done to actually remove the display if you are. For sure if you get all the solder through. Now before I go ripping this display out, I'm just gonna go through each pin and make sure it's loose all the way through, both on this back side and through the top side. There, I'm getting a nice wiggle on that side so that's loose. Just to make sure there isn't one pin just holding on there yet. This one here might have a little bit of solder yet on the top side. I'm just gonna a little pressure on see if it pops loose and it does okay so there's the display and here are the two bulbs that are now burned out in fact i'll plug it back in yeah they should be uh lit up right now and they're not so these are junk I'm going to be replacing those uh, incandescent lamps I just took off with white LEDs. These are a warm white, um, but even with them being a warm white, uh, it's still going to have a slightly different color temperature than the incandescent bulbs I took out. So the color of the display will be slightly different, but we are, um, you know, exchanging color difference for hopefully reliability since like I said earlier these uh, the LCD screen is on anytime the vehicle is on so um, we need uh, all the advantage we can get um, negative side down so if you're doing this uh, negative side of the LED is down positive side is up Now to remove the EEPROM, taking note that it is mounted uh, print side upside down. I just have to make myself a mental note so I remember to put the new replacement upside down also. Uh, yes, yeah, so did I say I'm just using my hot air station for this? Set to 350. The EEPROM is also conformal coated, but uh, you can just kind of hot air your way through that. Should come up any second now. There we go. Come on, focus. Yeah. Ah. 
And now to make the new EEPROM. So the generic part number for this EEPROM is a 95020. That's pretty common for uh, what, 99 all the way up to 2006 uh, Chevy stuff. Um, and I'm gonna be using my X100 tool again. Um, this tool comes in pretty handy because I also use it for not only uh, odometer correction on uh, cases where we have uh, odometer issues, but it's also used to store, copy and store bin files off of the EEPROMs. So I think I have that in the right way, yep. Um, let's power this thing up. So since I have done this before, I already have a copy of a good bin file that isn't corrupted for this vehicle. And I just have to remember what I named it. I think it is this one here. I don't know why I put 3D in there. Oh, three displays. Ah, that's right. Um, this cluster is available with a different amount of displays. This one has three displays. Now it's all coming back to me. So this is the correct file. It is for the three display unit because it is gonna be uh, a different bin file depending on the layout of the cluster. So I have the right file, which was already previously done. Uh, so now I can just copy that onto um, the uh, brand new blank EEPROM. There we go, recovery success. So now that file should be on here and if I put it in here, it should boot up and work. It's gonna show uh, whatever random odometer reading was in the file I uh, copied from, but that won't matter because I'm gonna use the same tool again to correct it to what it's actually supposed to be for the vehicle that it's going into. Okay, new EEPROM is in, upside down, just like it needs to be. And if my file works correctly, if everything copied over right, when I power this up, there should be a random amount of uh, odometer reading that comes up and the cluster should boot up normal. As normal as I can without the stepper motors and lights, but uh, should get some normal activity here. And yes, 124, it is working, thank God. Okay, it goes to error right away just because, again, uh, like I described earlier, this family of cluster will show error if it can't communicate. And right now it's not communicating to anything, so it uh, says error. But those first few seconds there, see that? There's a reading before it was just a zero. So now we have a working odometer. So I can continue with the rebuild, throwing in new light bulbs and stepper motors. So now the new X27 stepper motors are installed and all the new back lighting lamps have been installed. Now, as you can probably notice, I did not go with LED for the back lighting. And that is because again, of the color temperature differences that you get with LEDs. Uh, if I were to use white LEDs for back lighting, the cluster will look out of place when back in the dashboard next to all the other buttons, lights, and switches. So you don't, my goal is for the cluster not to look wrong. You know, I want it to look like it should look with matching color temperature when compared to the radio and climate control and whatnot. I don't want it to have a weird blue tint that stands out. Uh, plus I use a high hour light bulb. And uh, since these are only on when the headlights are on, we're still talking about a pretty long life 
uh, even though these are incandescent. Anyways, next step is to correct the odometer. So we're back with the X100, and I should be able to uh, enter in the correct miles for this vehicle, which is 150K. Um, I have to enter in kilometers because Chinese tool. Uh, and if it's communicating right, adjustment complete. Okay, so now when I boot it up, it should say 150, not 124. So let's just see what it does. So turn off the light here so we can see it better. 148, okay, I gotta nudge it up. It's working, but uh, I gotta add a couple hundred miles and try again. After a little trial and error with the programming, I got the target odometer reading at 150. Now all the repairs are done. It's just a matter of putting all the plastics back together and setting the needles. And here we are with all the plastics back assembled. And we should have a working odometer. Yes, that's registering the correct miles. Uh, now if I send it a serial bus signal and reboot it, that error message will completely stay away. Yeah, so now we go. Working now odometer, working trip. And uh, yeah, that's it for this video. Down below, I will include some affiliate links for the tools used in today's video. And uh, yeah, that's it for today. Thanks for watching.